program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. It's a magnificent day here in Africa. My name is James Hendry and this is Safari Live. Very special welcome to the kids of Corporate Landing and Trantwood Elementary Schools somewhere in the great United States. It's wonderful to have you with us. As I said, my name is James. Brian's on camera. Brian, what is the fun this afternoon? Oh, just the regular tie. Uh, the regular tie. Brian is just back from leave, as am I, and it's wonderful to have you kids with us. Please talk to us throughout the course of your little lesson here, and your teacher will sort that out for you, and she can talk to us, hashtag Safari Live, or on Skype, I don't know how she's doing it. For the rest of you who are watching, a slightly more adult nature, hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. It'd be lovely to hear from you. I am on foot, as you can see. I'm standing on a termite mound, for I'm not large of stature. And out in the vehicles, we've got Byron on one car. He's being filmed by Jean Dre, and I think that Viam is on the other car, filming the inimitable and irascible Brent Leo Smith. Now, our plan this afternoon is just to sort of wander gently around the bush. I've just come back from a holiday, everybody, so I'm very excited to see how things have changed. And what has changed is that we've had some rain, and so everything is just a little bit greener as we look around around here and most excitingly a very special bird has just arrived home and that bird is the woodland kingfisher and if you listen very carefully to both Brent's drive and to Byron's drive and to the walk you will hear and that's what the woodland kingfisher does. So I hope that we'll be able to find you one. He's a very beautiful bird with a bright red beak, a long beak, and a bright blue back. So now I'm going to ask you all in your classrooms right now, in the count of three, with me, go chip, brrr. Are you ready? One, two, three. Chip, brrr. So we'll try and find that bird for you. Now you may also have noticed over there is Aubrey. Now Aubrey... He's a tracker. He's a very fine tracker and he's going to be watching out for animals while we walk through here. He'll be finding us some small things, I'm sure, some scorpions, maybe some insects, and if there are any elephants or buffalo or that sort of thing, he'll spot them too. While we're looking for those creatures, let's head across to Brent Leo Smith and find out what he is going to be doing with you this afternoon. Well, welcome, welcome, guys. So great to have you on your very own African safari in school. I wish I could have done that while I was in school. My name is Brent, and on camera with me today is Viam, and uh, we're gonna go look for some lions. And uh, I fi we found some lions not far from here this morning. Well, someone else found them, told us where they were, so we trundled along, and we're going to do that. So I'm looking forward to having all your questions soon. And uh, it is wonderful to have you. As you can see, it's nice and green. We've had a little bit of rain, and James has already told you about the Woodlands Kingfisher. So I don't know how he did the call, but when I do the call, it sounds something like this. So we'll see if we can find you one calling, because the Woodlands does a much better job than any of us. Okay, so the lions went too far from here, but it's really, really hot today. It's uh, 99 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're keeping our air conditioner on at the moment, which means I'm driving. Hello, Avea. Avea would like to know what habitat are we driving through right now? Avea, as a general rule, it's called savanna. Uh, this particular area where we are at the moment is actually broad-leafed woodland, so it's uh, lots of different trees uh, interspersed by open grasslands. And uh, savanna is one of the biggest habitats in Africa. There's lots of different types of savanna, 
but most of the savannah we've got here is made up of bush willow trees, marula trees, terminalia trees, and also acacia trees. So we're very lucky, it's a very good area for animals. And they would also know, like to know, has the season been typical? Well, yes it has, uh, well, not before. We're getting about a normal amount of rain for this time of the year, although this year during our winter months, which is our dry time of the year, we've had the worst drought in 100 years. So some of the animals are still, still struggling with that, but it is looking better. As you can see, there's green, the grass is starting to grow. So hopefully we'll get a lot more rain and the animals will be much happier. Okay. Now, there's a little water hole up here that the lions might have come to because it's so hot to have a drink. They killed a buffalo not too far from here. So at the moment, or actually our lions here, their favorite food is buffalo because it's big and means when they kill one they can eat it for two or three days. A big buffalo can weigh about 2,000 pounds. So let's check carefully if there's any lions next to the water hole in the shade. Nope, so they must still be where we left them this morning. Now when lions are full, uh, they don't like to move too much. They like to sleep and they can sleep a lot. And on average a lion will sleep for 20 hours in a day. And when it's hot, they sleep more. So the lions are probably not going to move too much today. They'll probably only get up once it's dark. Now, Lions are mostly nocturnal, which means they move around at night, but all animals out here are opportunists. So if something happens that they want to move around during the day, if something walks up to them, they will. But because they're not very good at dealing with heat, they probably won't move around too much. Daniel, Daniel's wondering how many water holes do we have nearby? Well, Daniel, it completely depends. So during the rainy season, we've got lots of water holes, but sort of permanent or semi-permanent water holes. We've got one, two, three, we've got four semi-permanent water holes in this area. Now, I'll be very surprised if the lions have moved, but the animals out here like to surprise us. Because I'm coming to where I saw the lions this morning, and I can see a little stenborky. Now it's possible that that little antelope hasn't seen the lions. Oh, there he goes. And they're sleeping somewhere in the shade here. Now, let's have a look. The buffalo they killed is over there. Okay, well, I'm gonna look around here to see if I can find the lions, but they look like they might have moved to surprise me. And that's the one thing about the bush. It's always full of surprises and we're live, so you never know what's gonna happen next. So while we try to find the rest of these lions, Byron has found some more. And look what we've found. Hello everyone, we've found, it looks like two or three little cubs are hiding in the shade at the moment. I can't really see. It looks just like it might be the two. And what a nice surprise this is. I'm not sure where the rest of them are though. Just the two in the shade, but I'm sure that the females and perhaps the rest of the cubs are in the area. They must be around there somewhere. And hello, my name is Byron, and with me on camera is Jandre this afternoon. And it's lovely to have all of you with us. And I'm glad we've managed to just find these lines. I literally have been looking for them, and I've just found them. But it is very, very hot. So these lion cubs are doing what lions do best in the heat, and that's to try and rest and relax in the shade. Now I'm busy scanning around while we are sitting here to find the females. 
Ah, uh, Michael, a very good question. You want to know how do we find the animals when they are so well camouflaged? So, Michael, what we do is we try to look for tracks and we try to find their footprints walking across the roads, perhaps, or on paths in the bush. And that is the best way to try and find these animals that are so camouflaged. And also, we try and keep a very, very good eye out. We look very, very carefully while we are driving. And if you spend a lot of time in nature and in the bush you tend to pick up um, the animals a little bit easier you know what to look for and it might be easier to spot the animals and then uh, then it usually is but the camouflage does make it difficult but it helps if we know where their tracks are and if we can follow them that way to try and find them Uh, Gage, we've only seen two little lions. These are the little cubs. They're still very, very young, and I'm not sure where the rest of them are. Um, I will have a look around this area soon. I'll, we'll start driving around and just have a look. But this pride, Gage, there are four li or five lionesses and six cubs in this pride. So it's a wonderful size for a pride of lions. And a, a pride is another name for the family or the group of lions. Now, I'm not sure where the rest of them are. They're possibly just lying in the shade somewhere. Now, the Avion, you'd like to know how old these lion cubs are. So these lion cubs are about six months old now. I think they were born, if I'm not mistaken, around uh, June. So June, July, August, September, October, November. Almost, almost seven months, between six and seven months old. Um, and they're still, they're still quite small, still quite small. And they still rely so much on their, on their mothers, on the female lions, to provide food for them. Uh, now, Brent mentioned earlier how lions like to feed on buffalo. And Connor, you've asked how do they um, bring down the lion or how do they hunt the lion? Uh, sorry, how do the lions hunt the buffalo? And do they use a strategy? So they do, Connor, they do indeed. Lions are very, very intelligent. And they'll work together as a pride to try and hunt buffalo, especially something as big and as powerful as a buffalo. So when the buffalo is moving through an area, usually what happens is the lions will work to try and surround that buffalo and perhaps try and separate it from the rest of the herd and then what happens is they'll try and run and pounce and all of them will go together to try and pull that buffalo down and kill it and feed on it. It's not easy because the buffalo is very very powerful but, uh, but it does take quite a bit of effort from all of them. I'm just looking at some birds flying above us. Let's have a look here. You see them two very beautiful. Look at that. Oh, wonderful. Two lilac breasted rollers. And they are very beautiful birds. Look at that. Now, I'm not sure why they were making so much noise. It looks like they're just displaying. Listen to that very, very harsh call for a bird with such beautiful colors. It's got a very, very harsh call. And there are about seven different colors on that bird, everyone. So try and have a good look and see how many colors you can see. Look, while it flies, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful blue. It's a bit difficult to keep up with the birds, they're so fast. But that not that fantastic? So while we're sitting with the lions, there's still so much going on around us, especially with the birds, the birds calling and making a noise. I know James said you must try and listen out for woodland kingfisher while we are on safari. And I'll keep a good ear out and if I hear it, I'll try to point it out to you. These little cubs seem very comfortable in the shade. It's probably much cooler under there than it is obviously in the sun. 
but it's still very very hot for them and that's why they don't move around too much during the day they don't like the heat just like us Uh, Nicholas, um, <laughs> it's funny, you ask how do they stand the heat with all that fur? And you know, all these animals adapt very well to the type of surroundings and the weather or the climate that they, that they um, happen to, to experience in these areas. So what happens is there are ways for lions to keep cool. They'll try and pant a lot and that helps cool the body down. They'll lie in the shade. They won't stay out in the open. So that all, uh, all of that helps them stay cool, especially with their coats. But animals adapt to different climate times. So, or d climate situations, so very, very, um, very different to us. I mean, we take all our clothing off if we're very hot and jump into the pool, and or put a lot of jerseys on if we're very cold. The lions don't have to do that. Now, I'm going to see if I can find the rest of the pride. While I do that, let's head back to my friend James on the bushwalk and see what he has found. I have found a little piece of grass. Now, I know to some people, compared with lions, grass isn't very important. But of course, it's massively important. Without grass, none of the animals that the lions eat would be able to survive. Now, this particular grass is very beautiful, but it's actually not very good to eat. And that's probably why it survived. Hmm. You see, it tastes like bad sort of straw. Now that's the seeds. So all the seeds are in this grass here and it's called Aristida or three awn. And awns are these little sort of spiky bits that are on the ends of the seeds and inside at the end of each one is a tiny little seed of the grass and the awns will help it to go when the wind blows off they will go and that's how they disperse. Now disperse means they move around and that's where they grow. Then over here on the bottom, we've got the leaves. Now, if you're an animal and you like to eat grass, this is what you eat. You don't want to eat the seeds and the hard sort of strawy stuff that the seeds grow on. That's called the calm or the stalk. You like to eat the leaves. Now, the leaves of this particular one, not so bad when they're green, but not very good at all. Now let's try and find a nice piece of grass to eat. I'll show you. It's a bit like some of you might like to eat spinach, which is quite good for us, but if you go outside and say you find the leaf of an oak tree, that's disgusting to eat. Come and have a look here. Hello Caleb, while we look for a good piece of grass, you've asked a very sophisticated question. You say, how many different kinds of savanna habitats are there in the world? Caleb, I'm struggling to believe that that is a question from an elementary school student. You're obviously very clever indeed, so thank you for your question. Um, well, savanna habitats, it's difficult to say how many there are. Uh, it's probably a little easier to say where they are. So what you do is you'll find them all over, for example, East Africa, and you'll find them over Southern Africa here. Then I suppose you might find savanna habitats in places like Patagonia in uh, South America, or up sort of towards the fringes of the Amazon. And then I guess you might find savanna habitats in parts of Northern Europe and that sort of thing. And down into India, absolutely plenty of savanna habitats, even in the far east of Russia. Uh, so lots of different places. Difficult to say where exactly. But strictly speaking, of course, savanna, for those of you who don't know, is an area like this where you'd have lots of grassland, interspersed with trees. This is actually more woodland than it is savanna. There's more trees than there would be in a savanna area. Savanna, I'm, you've all seen the Lion King, right? Uh, if you go and look at the Lion King, well, that's the kind of habitat that we'd call savanna, with wide open spaces with just the odd tree popped up in between. Now, here's a much better grass. Can you see it's thicker? It's a deeper green, and this is like the spinach for a buffalo. Mmm, tastes much better than that nasty three on. Right, come on, let's keep walking. Uh, it's quite hot here, as I said, and it's still very nice, however, to be out here. Now, 
Anaya, you're wondering about drought and whether it's over and if flooding is a problem. The drought is definitely over. If we look around here with Brian, you can see that it's green on the ground and that's because there's grass. Grass only goes green after it's had rain and that means of course the drought is over. Is flooding a problem? Well, not so much in this area because in this area of course there are no major rivers but just about say five miles down from here there's a big river called the Sand River and on that river there are a whole lot of camps where people go on holiday and that sort of thing and quite often if there's a big big rain those camps will get washed away. So that is a little bit dangerous that's the kind of flooding that we have here but the rivers here even some of the I mean there's a small river just off there probably about a mile that way off to the east and that will flow probably once every two years or so but not enough to flood anywhere so there's not a lot of rain in an area like this but of course in other parts of South Africa lots of flooding up on the high felt which means the highlands in near Johannesburg sometimes they have flooding uh, down in the Cape near Cape Town very famous part of the world they do have flooding but that's in the winter time it's a different kind of climate. Right, let's keep going here. We haven't seen uh, too much just yet. We've seen one or two impala, which was quite nice. <laughs> De Avion, you say, why am I eating the grass? Now, that's a very good question. The reason I'm eating the grass, De Avion, is that I didn't have any lunch today, did I, Brian? No, you didn't. No, I didn't, so I'm very, very hungry. Ooh. I did have lunch today, De Avion. The reason I'm eating the grass is because I find it very interesting to taste what the animals are tasting. And while this would not be good for me to eat, or it wouldn't be a good substitute for food for me to eat, it's very nice to taste. And so what you will do is you read in books that some grasses are good for animals to eat and some grasses are not so good for animals to eat. And you can actually taste the difference as a human. And Brian and I have done a lot of tasting of just about all the grasses out here. And almost always, if in a book it says that it's good for an animal to eat, it actually tastes quite sweet and nice to us, which is very different from, for example, that three on. Now, Olivia, of course, we've just come out of a horrible drought, as was mentioned earlier, and you say, what do the animals eat when the grass all dries out? Well, come and have a look over here. Now, if we look down over here, what you can see is that the grass is very sparsely dispersed. So here it is, and then there's a huge gap in between. Now what happens during a drought or during the winter time, remember we have no rain here during the winter at all. What happens is this grass goes very dry, but because the animals have lived here for millions and millions of years, they've developed the ability to deal with it. So the grass is brown, and to you and I it looks like there's nothing at all to eat. But the animals manage to survive, except in a very bad drought like we've just had. And we've had lots of animals that have uh, really suffered as a result because they can't find enough to eat. So although to you and I, it looks like this is good grazing, it's good food to eat, it is good food to eat, but during a, uh, the winter time when everything goes brown and grey here, it's still actually not too bad for the animals like the buffalo and sometimes the impala for example, which move from eating grass to eating the leaves of trees and that's called browsing. That's a really good question. But we must remember of course that all the animals out here have managed to develop strategies to survive in these conditions. Now, Grace, you want to know how long uh, droughts normally last, and I think it was Liliana, you want to know when it started. Well, you see, a drought's a difficult thing to, to talk about or to define exactly when it starts. It's difficult to say whether it started, uh, you see, what we have here, just let me take it back, is a summertime when there's rain, then in wintertime there's no rain at all. Then if you have the next summertime after the dry season that has no rain, then you have a drought. So that's what we had last time. So we had the wind dry winter season of 2015. Then we had the summer season, say between September and March of 2016. There was no rain then either. Then we had another dry season between the winter of, so for the winter of 2016, so between say May and September of 2016, and only then did it rain. So I suppose you might say that the drought was almost a year. Uh, so a drought would have started here, I suppose, after the summer rains didn't come around November 2015, and then the drought would have broken, well, only about a month ago in October of 2016. So that's probably the best answer I can give you on that one. Now we're going to 
keep trying desperately to find a woodland kingfisher. I just want to see if you can hear it there. No, all you can hear is the wind. But Brent Leo Smith has got something very interesting to show you. Well, fortunately, our search seems to be going a little bit better. As I said, I was looking for three big male lions. I haven't found three big male lions, unfortunately. I've found two. So, I'm sure the third one is probably lying in some shade close by. We just can't see them at the moment. So, there we go. So, these are the big daddy lions. And you can see they've got very full tummies. They ate a whole baby or a young buffalo last night. And uh, now they're resting in the shade. They came for a drink at a little water hole, and then they've just moved beyond into a little dip where there was some shade to, to rest up. Hello, Sunia. Sunia would like to know, are the lions protected from hunters? Indeed they are, Sunia. There's no hunting allowed in eight and a half million acres. Isn't that amazing? A massive area that's protected. No animals are allowed to be hunted within that area. So there we go. Isn't that wonderful? So they are very protected. When they die, they normally die from natural causes, which in lion life means they're normally killed by another male lion. Hi, Olivia. Olivia would like to know, why do lions hunt at night? Well, there's a couple of reasons, Olivia. Well, number one is it's cooler, and they're able to move around better when it's cooler. As you can see, when it's hot, they don't move too much at all. Number two, their eyesight is designed to hunt at night. So they've got much better eyesight at night than we do, but about eight times what we can see at night and also better eyesight than all the antelope, impala and zebra, well, that's not an antelope, but uh, all the animals that they hunt, uh, they can see better. So it gives them some cover, and the cover of darkness, as well as the fact that it's cool enough that they're able to move for extended periods. Now, a big male lion's paw is about the size of a side plate, and they're incredibly strong animals. Uh, these guys probably weigh around 400 pounds and they've got that big fluffy mane around their neck. Now the females, which you've seen with Byron, don't have that and that's because the females don't fight as often as the males and that big fluffy hair is to protect their throat and back of their neck, the vulnerable areas if they get into a fight. Oh, he's tired, he's going to roll over. Anna Grace is wondering, what is the predator of lions? Uh, Anna Grace, um, other lions are, are, are the biggest killer of, of lions, particularly male lions, and groups of male lions, when they're young, they move through, and if they want to take over an area, they'll kill other lions, females and males. And these guys, when they did, they came through, they killed a bunch of cubs as well as three or four adult females before they calmed down and became the, the kings of the prides in this area. So there's four of them, even though we can only see two at the moment, and uh, they defend an area together. And these four lions have three different prides. So the one pride you've already seen, which is the Inkahuma pride with Byron, and then they have a Styx pride, which is to the east of, or southeast of us, and the Torchwood pride, which is to the east of us. So they will move between the different prides unless, and they often move without seeing the lionesses for quite some time. And if they hear another male lion start roaring in the north, then all four of them will rush there to go defend their territory together. Now that's why coalitions are so important for lions. So if there's four of you, you've got a better chance of being able to keep an area for longer. Now also a lot of people think male lions don't hunt. Of course they do. They spend so much time away from the females. And uh, they spend so much time away from the females. And while they're away from the ladies, they've got to hunt for themselves. Generally they'll hunt quite big things like buffalo and giraffe, hippo. Now Gage is wondering why only the males have names. Well at the moment Gage... Uh, the males have sort of very 
distinguishable characteristics that a lot of the lionesses don't have. Now that male lying on his back, his name is Dino. The tooth, uh, you can't really see on his right hand side, he's got a scar that lets you see his tooth and it was from a fight. Now the other male lying there, now we haven't seen this, these guys, two of them for quite a while and I'm not sure who this one is. He's either Nena, the warrior, or Tsugu Gold from his golden mane. Uh, who do you think it is, Vim? I don't know either. Yes, I'm not sure which one this is. Um, especially when they're lying down flat like that, it's quite difficult to see. Uh, um, I'm trying to see his ears, so how we identify different lines is from scars and uh, quite often nicks in the ear. And the way he's lying at the moment, I can't really see his ears too clearly or any nicks or scratches or scars. And the one difficult thing about scars is male lions are constantly adding to their scars. They're always fighting, quite often with each other over girlfriends uh, or over food. So as I was just saying, Liliana, that the males often spend quite a bit of time away from the family because they've got to protect the family from other lions. And they've got more than one family. These lions have three families they have to protect. So they move between the different families. So sometimes they're with the families, sometimes they're not. But we're going to sit here and hopefully we can find the other two lions that are missing. And uh, if we can't, we'll just have a look at these two. Before we do that, let's go back to Byron, who's with the Inkahuma and Cubs. And uh, we've managed to find the rest of the lions, everyone. And the females, all four females, and the rest of the cubs. Some of them have just moved now, but we've got two beautiful females here with the one cub. It looks like this cub's trying to suckle a little bit, trying to get some milk from the mother. It's still very, very hot, so they're staying in the shade. But the other lioness and some of the cubs moved to that area where we first saw the two little cubs. So I might, we're just going to sit here a little bit and see. Maybe these lions get up and move too. And the little male cubs don't have manes yet, like those big ma males that Brent has found. It's only when they get older, so from around the age of about, um, or from two years old already, you can start seeing little bits of hair growing around the neck, but it won't be nearly as big as those big males that Brent has got. And usually from the age of about four or five years old, you'll start seeing the mane getting very very big and then the older they get it does get a bit bigger and a bit thicker but only from about four or five years old is when you start seeing those big manes so not yet these little cubs are still far too young to have big manes It's very difficult to say how many lions are in a pride, usually, because pride sizes can vary and be very, very different. Now, this pride, as we said, there are four lionesses and six cubs, and look, here come the other cubs now. They're coming back to these females. Ah, oh, look at that, rubbing up against them. Wonderful. So Chris, some prides I've seen three lions together, some prides I've seen 15 or 20 lions together. That's a very, very big pride. So it varies, all depends on the area that they are in, how successful they are, how much food is around, all of that. So there's no um, exact answer as to how many lions are usually in a pride.
Now I can hear that Let's just stop now That woodland kingfisher that James said We must listen out for We'll see if we can hear it again Maybe it calls, I can't see it They're very secretive little birds Uh, Davion, you want to know about the lion roar and is it instinct or is it learnt behaviour? Uh, it most certainly is instinct. I think lion roars are instinct. They do learn it obviously from adults when they, um, and I've seen it before with a whole pride. Males, females and little cubs trying to roar before. I've seen that once before. Very, very interesting. But So they do probably learn it a little bit from the from the females or, or I mean, sorry, from the, the adults um, when, uh, when there is a uh, when they are all together but but it is instinct they know that they have to roar and uh, they know how to roar obviously when they're young like this they don't roar nearly as loudly as these big line these females do all those big males but um, but when they get older and bigger that roar will be very very loud So, Owen, you want to know why do we call a group of lions a pride and not a pack? So, Owen, a pack or the word pack is usually referred to animals like dogs. So, a group of dogs um, or any canine species, and that's the family that dogs belong to. They are known as pack animals. So, in this area, we have African wild dogs, and they are referred to as a pack. Um, also, if you have, um, if you perhaps have a um, Maybe jackal, um, it's often a, a pack of jackals if there are a few of them around. Um, but the, the cats, because they are big cats, part of the feline family, and I'm not exactly sure where the name pride comes from, um, but the, the, that is the term given to lions specifically, not other cats. So it's only lions, big groups of lions, because they are social animals and you always find them in big family groups. Sure, it's very, very hot out here at the moment. The lions are clever, they're in the shade, but they've left no shade for us. Cash, you'd like to know, is there a queen lion? Because often you've heard the term that the males are the kings of the jungle, or the king of the jungle. Now, I wonder about that, and maybe you can all think about this. Um, so, technically, there isn't a term for the, the queen lion. We don't use that term. But the lions, um, the male lions, have no, been known as the king of the jungle for a long time, before we were even around. But I wonder, and I'll tell you why. So, think about this. We've seen... An I've seen many times where lions are lying around and um, per or perhaps on the move and they bump into elephants and elephants are very very big and powerful and I've seen elephants chase lions away so I wonder who is actually the king of the jungle if it might actually be the elephant At least there's a bit of movement from these lines.
Leah and Cora, you want to know if the lions migrate to follow their prey. So, Leah, in these areas where we are, and now we are in South Africa, right down the southern part of Africa, um, these lions do not migrate. They are here all year round, um, even in the winter. And the reason for that is the animals that they feed on are also here all year round. They, um, they do not move and they, um, they do not migrate. You might know some um, animals up in East Africa. You get migrations of zebra and wildebeest up in those areas in Kenya and Tanzania because they need to follow where the food is and where the, um, where the water is. Whereas these lions, because there's generally food and water throughout the year, even in winter down in these parts of Africa, they don't have to migrate. So no, they will not migrate at all. They don't have to follow their prey. There will always be food around for them. Alexis, you want to know if female lions are calmer than the male lions? Now, that's, uh, it, it depends. I think if you had to get too close to these little cubs, no, they won't be calm at all. They'll be very aggressive. But generally speaking, the, the males are a bit more aggressive. They are more powerful than the females, and they can be aggressive, especially when they get to a kill. If there's food for them, they fight amongst themselves to feed on the best food. But these females will definitely be quite aggressive too if you do threaten them. Alright, we're going to see what these lions do if they move around some more. But while I do that, let's head back to James who's on a big tree trunk. I'm on a big tree and I'm standing like Rafiki. But it doesn't very comfortable, unless you're a baboon like he was. Now, we've come into this area because we heard some kudu alarm calling. Our kudu is a very large antelope and it goes bah, bah, when it sees something dangerous like a predator. Now, we think the predator is somewhere up here. And so I've stepped onto this tree to look and see if we can't spot something. Now, you might be asking yourself, is it not dangerous to be out here? Well, it's a little bit dangerous, but it's the same as if you had to go to a very big city and you didn't understand how cars worked, for example, then it would be dangerous if you tried to cross a road. But here, because we've been trained and because we were a man like Aubrey, who has been here for so many years, it's not that dangerous. So what we do is we walk very carefully and we carry on and we see if we can't find some tracks which would be the footprints of whatever predator it is that the kudu alarm called at. And the other thing we do, you see this here, we just check which way the wind is blowing. See that? So the wind is blowing very well for us. It's blowing across us like that, so if there's a predator there, it won't smell us coming. Now, Jessica, while we walk looking for this predator, we're going to talk quite quietly. We'll carry on. Oh, Aubrey's actually spotted the kudu. There's the kudu there. Can you see it there, Brian? Now, that kudu was looking the other way. So we don't know exactly what it was looking at. Could have been a leopard, could have been another lion, but because lions are territorial, in other words, they tend to spend time in the same area, it's much more likely that it's a leopard that's gone walking past this kudu on the hunt. They tend to move more in the day, and the kudu's got a fright, and it's gone bah, bah, which is just sort of shouting and telling all its friends, I've seen something, and it's also telling the predator, I've seen you, move along. Now, as we move along, you want to know how far we walk in a day. It really does depend on what we see. So, we have walked thus far probably about two miles so far. I don't think we'll pro we probably won't walk more than four miles today, but sometimes we can walk up to eight miles. Gavin, you ask a very good question. You say, why am I carrying the stick? Gavin, it's simply because I like to carry a stick in the bush. There's no other reason for it. I was looking for a stick. I had a very nice stick that Brent gave me, and then I broke that one. And Aubrey found me this stick today. So this is my new stick, and hopefully I'll be able to keep it. I just like to use it to point with, uh, to uh, sort of hit Brian when he's not behaving. You see, because he's much bigger than me, so I need to be able to hit him. That's not very true. I just like to walk with a stick. Oh, look here. Look what Aubrey's found here. 
Here I'm just asking Aubrey what he thinks has happened here. Hmm? Sheen. Yeah. Right, what we have here, everybody, we think is signs that a leopard has climbed at the tree. So what it does is it sticks its claws in like that and then climbs up, just like your house cats will be able to do, and they climb up, but because this is a marula tree, you can see the bark comes off. It flicks off. And so with the big claws of the leopard go in like that, and maybe in like that, and up it goes. And there's definitely no leopard in the top of the trees there, Brian. No, no leopard in the top of this tree. So we think maybe that this is quite old damage. We don't think this is very new, but that's probably what pulled the bark off the tree. Isn't that very really cool? A leopard, of course, is this prince of cats, if you like. We're talking about the king of the jungle. I agree with Byron that the, the, um, the real king of the elephants, or the real royalty is the elephants, but the real prince is the leopard. And that's what we're hoping to find right now. Now, Haley, while we walk along here, you want to know if there's anything we can do about the drought to save water. Well, you know, interestingly, this is a, this, uh, sorry, Caled, not Haley. I'm not sure where I got Haley from. Uh, Caled, it's an interesting one because you know what? Out here, Caleb, yes, that's what I said, I think. Caleb, um, the big thing about saving water, interestingly, is that it's normally people who live in cities who are able to do much more about a drought than we can out here, for example. So here, we take a bit of water out of the ground, but remember, we don't wash cars, we don't have baths, we've got showers, of course, we don't have swimming pools, we don't um, have, say, two or three bathrooms per house. So it's, it's people in cities who use much more, more water than people who live in areas like this. And so it's actually people in cities who have to take much more responsibility for the water that they use than we do out here. Yes, we have to be very careful. We make sure that we don't waste water, that our taps don't run, that our toilets don't run and that sort of thing, and that we don't waste water with things like too much washing and that sort of stuff. But it's when you go to the cities, when you've got to clean the house, you've got two or three flush toilets, you've got a two or three sinks that clean things, you've got a washing machine, you've got a hose pipe in the garden that's watering the garden, you've got a swimming pool, like I said, that sort of thing really does waste a lot of water. And so that's where you've got to be really very careful about how much water you use. Very, very good question, Caleb. Now, we haven't found any more tracks of this leopard, but we might be lucky. So we'll just keep walking and see what else we can find as we go. <laughs> Vijay, you're going to answer this question for yourself. You say, why do the kudu shout when they see a predator? Well, Vijay, what do you do? Tell me something. If you're on the playground, right, and a bigger kid comes up to you and you feel scared by that bigger kid, what do you do? If you want to know that you want him to go away, what do you do? You shout at him, of course. And then, also by shouting, what you do is you attract the attention of your friends. And so your friends will look too and they'll come and maybe they'll stand next to you and the big kid who wants to be nasty to you will go away. It's a little bit the same. That's exactly what a kudu does. When it feels afraid, it shouts to say, hey! I see you! Go away! Oh, go away! Go away! Leave me alone! Go away! And that's what it's doing. Now I'm hoping to find some kind of interesting antelope to show you. Oh, Anaya, you say, are the animals running free? Anaya, we are sitting in eight and a half million acres of wildlife land, okay? That's three times the size, if I'm not mistaken, of Yellowstone National Park. It's our massive area. It's not a plantation. There's no fence here. We don't know what we're going to see around the next bush. So it really is, all the animals are completely free and wild over here. Let's have a look at this plant here. In fact, no, let's not look at that plant. Let's look at this, because to many of you, this will be quite familiar. What we have here is a whole lot of Dung. Now, dung, of course, in anyone else's language, is poo. And this particular poo is very well aged. Mmm, smells very good. Mm, a fine vintage. A fine vintage. It smells a little bit like spices mixed with mushrooms. Mmm. Now, 
come and have a look a little bit closer and what this is is zebra dung so a zebra has come along here and many of you who have ridden horses or seen horses on farms will know that that's exactly what a horse's dung look like looks like when it gets a bit old and that's what that is see and it smells actually very nice because it's just grass beautiful now to corporate landing and Trantwood Elementary. It's been wonderful having you with us. We're going to continue hopefully looking for this leopard and in the meantime we hope that you have a wonderful day, the rest of your day at school. Enjoy your school days and we'll hopefully see you on safari again very soon. <laughs>all our regular viewers as we can see we're still with those two Birmingham boys and uh, we decided to do what they were doing we got really hot over there so we found ourselves our own little spot of shade now as you can see there are Mfumo and uh, Amber Eyes are around here somewhere but it is a very thick area behind where we are so quite difficult to see without I don't think there's going to be much action here for the next while so I think we're going to leave at the Birmingham boys. Now, can anyone tell me who the Birmingham boy on the right is? I, I, I do not know whether it's Nena or Mtsugu. I look at his ears. I can't see any distinguishing marks. And I haven't seen these lines in so long. Now, the problem is he had that equal sign across his nose if it was Nena. But those type of... Uh, scars change so regularly so if anyone can tell me who it is i would be most appreciative remember hashtag safari live or questions at wildearth.tv if you do that okay so they said not much happening here they're going to be fast asleep for the next little while. Maybe we'll come back here later. I still think Queen Karula's around somewhere. So, definitely worth having a look. So, while we leave these sleeping lions, I'm sure, hopefully, Byron's lions are a little bit more active. Now, these lions are not quite sleeping, everyone. They, um, they are just cleaning and grooming themselves. The cubs have been quite quite active, moving backwards and forwards between the different females um, and around in the shade. But, um, but they are still fairly f f fairly settled um, I think because it is still so hot. I think all that's happened is they've split up a little bit. Some are lying about 30 or 40 meters behind us and then a few of them are lying right here next to us. <laughs> the flies are probably bothering them quite a bit too. You can see that little cub. Just like we saw, I mean, yesterday afternoon we saw that, that Birmingham male who was uh, out in the clearing and geez, the flies would not leave him alone. their paws. I wonder why they would be doing that now because I mean that's I don't know when last they had a kill but uh, lions generally groom themselves quite regularly uh, maybe maybe try and get little ticks that might be sitting around those paws or with them walking through the long grass that's potentially what they're trying to do you can see this lioness is actually trying to bite use her teeth to clean so there might be something in there fleas or ticks that she's trying to get out Dara, interesting question, um, and you wanted to know if the, if a little cub is born with a, a hearing problem or an eyesight problem, does the pride abandon it? So, usually, see, I don't really know, and I'll tell you why, is because 
all the cubs that I've seen, so, okay, let's start from the beginning. Actually, hang on, this one line S is up. Let's just have a look. I'll get back to your question now, Dara. Let's just see what these lines do. I might just change position and lie in the shade there again. So Dora, what happens is, if we, let's look at the beginning now, when lions give birth to cubs, so the first um, few weeks, the first few weeks of these little cubs' lives, they are in a den site. They are completely helpless. They rely solely on the female to come back and, and allow them to suckle from them. So what happens is, now I, I'm trying to think now, it's about a month and a half to two months before those cubs are brought out of the den site. She may move the den site slightly, but she will carry those cubs to a new den site, but not far from the original den site. But what happens then is when she does decide to now move the cubs, usually the weaker ones, the ones that probably can't see or probably can't hear, when she arrives back and she contact calls for them to come out and suckle them, if those cubs are not able to get food or get milk and suckle from the female, they won't survive anyway. So it's a case of them not surviving rather than a case of them being abandoned. I th and again, I say I think because a lot of the time we don't see that. When they young and they're in the den you very seldom see these little cubs unless they get brought out into an open or perhaps onto the rocky outcrop where they might be hiding um, or, or in a thicket out of the, out of the thicket where they might be in a den around there so I think it's more of a case of them just not getting enough food um, rather than a case of them being in danger uh, um, abandoned and I think that is usually what happens and the strongest cubs will survive the weak ones will not and and that again is survival of the fittest out here and that's how nature maintains a balance with the healthy animals surviving and the weaker um, or, um, or animals that won't survive potentially are going to die. Now, these lines, to be honest, I don't think they're going to move anytime soon. Even though their heads are up, it's it's very, very warm. Um, I mean, I could I could be mistaken, and it's always a tough call if they're going to move or not. Trevor, you wanted to know if the lions are immune or other animals are immune to tick bite fever. I've never, I've never seen or heard of lions uh, contracting tick bite fever. They do build up an immunity to the ticks to an extent. Some animals, um, if the ticks really infest them completely, they can suffer some serious damage from the ticks rather than an actual tick bite fever like we contract from ticks. But I've never seen lions uh, be harmed by ticks or anything like that. All the animals get them, they build up an immunity. And uh, and it usually doesn't affect them like it affects us. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to leave these lines. I, like I said, I don't think they're going to move anytime soon. It's still very, very warm. They're enjoying the shade. There's a bit of a cool breeze here. So I'm going to move out. We can potentially try and come back later. Or maybe also try for those males a bit later, depending where Brent is. But while we do that, let's head back to James. It's all great to have James back and uh, see what little creature he has got for us. This is not easy everybody, there's a butterfly here, a gorgeous butterfly called the yellow pansy. Have you got it Brian? I do. Isn't he wonderful? Or she? Now I'm going to teach you a word in Shitsonga or Shangan and it's my, one of my favourite Shangan words and that is the word paparati which means butterfly or moth. Paparati. This is a very irritating form of paparati. Here it is, Brian. This is just behind us here on the road, next to that giant pile of dung. Brian is doing an exceptional job just back from leave. Can you see it there? Here we are. And of course, the reason that it's totally invisible when it folds its wings is a very clever 
uh, sort of anti-predation strategy. So it opens its wings. I'm not sure, I mean, I, I assume it's coloured like that in order to attract a mate, but that's actually rubbish. I'm not sure why it should be coloured like that, of course, because its mate is exactly the same colour. But it does fold its wings completely. Here we go. And when it does that, of course, it becomes invisible. Now, I've just... Uh, it's amazing, you know, you come out here, I've been wandering about these lands for the last 15 years or so. That sounds very romantic, doesn't it? Wandering these lands for the last 15 years. But I've never asked myself the following question. Why should it be that butterflies are colourful? And in much the same way as I've yet to hear a valid argument for why it is that both sexes of the lilac-breasted roller are colourful, I'm not sure that I know why butterflies are colourful. Uh, it cannot be to attract mates because they're both the same colour as each other. So I do really don't know. Any ideas, Judy H? Well, you know, I've been away for a while, which means that your, uh, well, your, your need to school me has been sort of uh, reduced. Perhaps you could help out. Why is it anybody? Hashtags for life, questions at wildearth.tv, terms and conditions of bio, batteries not included. Tell us why you think butterflies perhaps are both male and female the same colour and why they're so bright. In the case of something like a common diadem, or uh, not a common diadem, in, ca in the case of a monarch butterfly, of course, that orange and black and white coloration is aposomatic. So it's supposed to be terrifying to predators because it means that they are in fact toxic, that they're full of, um, what are they called? Cardioglycosides that really are very dangerous for the heart and so that means that animals avoid them. Then in the case of the common diadem, which is a similar color to the monarch, but of course it is totally harmless, so it's what we call Batesian mimicry, it's so it's, it's, it's mimicking the colour of a much more toxic animal. Well, that's why it's that colour. And in those two species, in the common diadem, the male is a completely different colour from the female. So that's quite easy to understand. But that thing isn't poisonous, I don't think. I don't think that that black and yellow coloration means anything necessarily from a predation point of view. So why it should be that colour, I don't know. And while, of course, you consider this, I would like you to look at um, the injury that I have uh, sustained on uh, your behalf everybody in order to find you entertainment here I am risking life and limb you see that Brian it's terrible. it is terrible and Brian says that I have a fight with sticks of course and he is right I'm not very good with the sticks but don't worry we'll be okay we'll make it all the way around we're heading sort of towards Treehouse Dam now and I don't want you to worry about me in the slightest I'm okay Okay, that's enough of that. Right, okay. We gave up on trying to find those leopard tracks. We've sent Brent kind of around that area, and while he heads into that direction, let's find out if he's managed to find anything that was perhaps causing those kudus to shout. Hello, well, we've left those sleepy male lions and we've taken James's advice. He's told us to check this area for a possible leopard. So that's what we're going to do. And hopefully it is a Queen Karula. And hopefully she's got both cubs, but I'll accept any leopard for now. Nice to have the Inkawumas back on the property. And uh, nice to have all three, all three of the four Birmingham boys here as well. It's been a while since we've seen all four of them together. I know they were all four were together on Torchwood last week or the week before. So they still are a force to be reckoned with. They haven't split yet and they still do come together. Uh, which is a good sign for the strength of the coalition lasting longer. Oh, Franklin's. So this is the area James thinks we should check. Now I think Byron seems like he's had the same plan as me. The lions are going to be flat and lazy on this hot summer's day. And so he's gone off to find something else and he's now found something he forgot to get out of its pajamas. 
and look what we've managed to find already a beautiful zebra there were there was another one around here um, but I'm not sure where it's moved off to there's some impala you might see them coming into frame they're walking just behind that zebra at the moment a bit difficult to see a little bit off to the, in the thicket there they are one or two impala but always nice to see zebra around one thing we haven't seen and people always ask me what do guests usually ask for when they're on safari now a zebra is one of them people love seeing zebra because they're so strange they're so different and then the other animal is giraffe and we haven't seen giraffe for, for, for quite some time i'm not sure why it is um, perhaps they're all on holiday somewhere <laughs> We're <laughs> not far from the gate, so a few vehicles driving past us, but these animals don't seem to be too phased. Still feeding very happily over there. It's always nice to see zebra. Also, just enjoying the, the trying to stay closer in between the thickets um, under the under the shade of the trees around, or there's a little bit of shade around there. But they're not as um, as reliant on shade as as uh, some of the predators are. You know, those predators love moving into the into the shade during the heat. And we're not too far from those lions, so there's impala and zebra better be careful. But this area is quite open and I think it would be difficult for the lions to hunt. Even though there are some trees around, um, it's fairly uh, fairly open. You can have a look. I mean, if you look at this terrain, it would be difficult for the lions to hide and stalk some of these animals um, out in the open. Perhaps, you never know, but maybe later when it gets a bit darker and a bit cooler. I doubt any time soon. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to head towards uh, Sydney's Dam and to go and have a look around there purely because it's hot and I'd like to see if it filled up at all from that rain that we had last night and then maybe we're lucky and we get some animals that are drinking around there or just moving through that area. of buffalo in the air at the moment maybe from the Unkahuma pride we know they've been very successful with buffalo but there have been a lot of buffalo carcasses around and you can definitely smell it while I head towards Sydney's dam let's head back to Brent and get an update on where he is okay well no sign of anything just yet we're just going very very slowly through here and um, hoping to spot some sign of a leopard some cloud cover coming in bring the temperature down a little bit so we're going to check Rebecca's road now that's where Byron found Karula last night and uh, who knows, maybe Rebecca's road is going to be lucky two evenings in a row. Now, this is a great area for it to hunt. So you've got impala herds. And you've got nice thickets on the edge. So we can't see any impala, but there are a lot here, but they've got these lovely thickets that she can utilize while she's hunting. But we're going to keep checking very, very carefully, but it sounds like Commander Bond is on fire and found something very interesting. 
I don't think I'm on fire. Are we on fire, bro? No. It is quite hot, though, isn't it? Yeah. Now, on account of the heat, we've decided to show you something that Aubrey has just shown us. This is, of course, the baboon's tail, which many of you will know backwards by now. But what I didn't know is that actually we've spoken a lot about how the capillary action of this plant, so you can see that it's got very sort of thin tubes it's made of, and that sucks water out of the soil. But on a hot day like this, if we go to here, Brian, look over here where my hand is. If you pull that out, especially after there's been rain, that is edible. And it's quite moist. If you're thirsty and hungry, mm. after a long day in the bush, you can have a little bit of baboon's tail, and we'll give Brian some because he's, Please. of course, doing most of the work out here. And just in case you're wondering, of course, Aubrey is on security detail. Nice there you go, right. Brian. And um, of course, he's also, as Herbert does, he's also on teaching detail for those of us who didn't grow up in this area. And it's a great joy to have him with us for the first time. Um, Aubrey, of course, is a guide at Juma. And he's just helping out today. Herbert is currently driving, I think, some staff because today was the Juma staff Christmas party. Cat, interesting one from you about why butterflies should be coloured. You say maybe it's so that they can fool predators into believing that they're birds. Cat, I don't think that's the reason because I think size would make a greater difference. And that's an interesting one because, of course, we know that moths often have what look like owl's eyes on their backs. And I think maybe they, they have those uh, sort of owl's eyes in order to try and con predators into believing that they're something bigger than they really are. So that's possible. But I don't think so for a butterfly like that somehow. Now, here is a burrow. And I can only think that this was dug by Brian. Say it with me. An artfark. And an artfark, of course, an ant bear. A long-nosed, long-tongued, long-clawed anteater, roughly the size of about four and a half feet long, and really very, very powerfully built indeed. This one, of course, is not here anymore. And it's often thought that artfark <laughs> wonderful word to say, uh, like to eat only termites, but actually they eat a lot of ants, and I suspect that this here was an ant nest rather than a termite nest, because there doesn't seem to be any obvious termite activity here. But you can see he's dug in here. He probably spent the night here. He, the artfark of this area may well come around here and spend some more time here, sort of used as a temporary burrow but at the moment is completely unoccupied, and we know that because there are no flies. Often you find a very specific kind of sort of browny, tawny fly that lives above the burrow if there's an artfark inside. And of course, over here, if I leave a fresh put footprint, you can see that's what a fresh foot fresh footprint fresh footprint looks like over here. And there are none of those here other than mine and Brian's. Very nice. On we go. Now we have failed to find, it's quite interesting of course, now many of you will know that I've been away for a while and um, well, we've found something else to eat here, hang on, I'll carry on with that thought. This is Mbezana and it's a ripe one, the first ripe one of the season that I found. Well I haven't found it, Aubrey found it. Thank you Aubrey. Now, do you want to share it? <laughs> okay. Mmm, that's really not bad. I have, well that's actually quite nice. I've had these things before when they've been unripe and they are truly disgusting. Now this of course we've described as being your Sunday lunch of roast chicken and apple crumble and custard mixed together as one. And so it is. They have found Karula. I'm sure that's what that kudu was alarm calling at earlier. So Brent is there with the great queen. Let's go and find out how she is. Well, there we go. Well, we did, James and Aubrey did hear that 
alarm call in this area and we were just behind Ephraim when he found Queen Karula atop a termite mound on Rebecca's road. So that's two days in a row we've managed to find Karula in this area. Now, can't see how hungry she is or whether she's going to get moving again shortly, but the likelihood is that if we find her sitting out in the open like this is that she hasn't made a kill. So it's possible. I know she was quite hungry yesterday. I'm sort of surprised she didn't manage to make a kill in the dark stormy weather of last night. VM says she looks full. Did you, you were with Byron last night, eh? You saw her? No, I can't remember who was. No, you were with me yesterday. Um, it was hot, so we're not sure. I didn't see her yesterday, but we'll see when she gets up. Maybe she's snacked on a baby in parlor, but not enough to call the cubs in. And it doesn't seem like there's any carcass around here. And from where the hukuru were alarm calling all day, earlier, she's obviously been on the move. Now, it's quite interesting. As the cubs have become older, we have started seeing her more and more on Juma again, whereas when they were younger, she spent a lot of time to the south of our boundary. There we go. You can see those impressive markings on the Queen of Juma. Now, for an, a leopard of her age, she's in incredibly good condition. And if you look at her ears, just a little bit of tattering starting from all the different bites from those evil stable flies. Oh, she's got a big tick in her ear today. That looks nearly full, so it'll probably drop off soon. But you see those tiny little flies that cause her ears to flick are called stable flies. So the same species or family of flies that attacks domestic dogs and horses. They look very similar to the common house fly, apart from the fact they're evil little bloodsuckers. They occasionally feed on us as well while we out chat. Now, they can cause some problems for big cats. It's never been recorded in South Africa, but lions in Kenya and Tanzania have uh, got serious, serious emancipation problems from a massive infestation of stable flies, which, I mean, they cover nearly their whole body. And in the Ngorogoro crater in the 60s, and it caused the lion population to drop from 75 to 60. And not all of them died, a lot of them just moved away because the flies were so incessant. There she is. Well, great to catch up with Karula for the second day in the row, and it seems like everyone out there has started our second cat streak. We're on day two. Can we get to that magical 90 days? Uh, we nearly got there this time, but uh, three months of cats every day. I think the summer months are going to prove to be slightly more difficult to produce that. But you know what? We're up for a challenge. So Karula does move quite a bit during the day and in the heat, which is, well, well, not unusual, but uncommon for a leopard. Now, you'll notice that a lot of literature, especially older literature on leopards, say they don't move around that much during the day. And that is true for areas where they're heavily persecuted, heavily hunted, um, or have a lot of conflict with people. But in areas where they're completely protected, you'll notice that quite a few of the the leopards will move around any time of the day and Karula seems to do it a lot and she also hunts quite a lot during the the hot time of the day and it is quite a good good strategy if you're a small leopard like Karula because you immediately avoid conflict with things like lions and hyenas uh, and male leopards but uh, hopefully she's going to be on the move and on the hunt a little later Now, 
There's a lot of Impala around here, a lot of baby Impala as well. So you probably find she is going to focus her efforts on those at the moment. And it sometimes makes our life a bit difficult because when she does catch one, she doesn't leave a nice drag mark for us to follow. And of course, after the rain, the the ground is quite hard so again tracking is very difficult but that's where another set of tracking skills comes in that's where your ears come in uh, listening for those alarm calls not only from the big things like kudu but also from little things like cisticulars and wax balls they can often lead you to incredible sightings but while Karula sits atop her termite mound and uh, while we wait for her to get moving Byron has got a bird that's ready to pop. And that is a fantastic find by Brent. I'm so glad he got to find Karule. He was looking yesterday and oh, it's so great to see her up on a termite mound. Now we have found a very interesting little bird, a black bellied bustard. But it's not often we get so close to one. It's very close to the vehicle and it's got We've got such a nice view of it. I'm going to see if I can try get it to call for us. Maybe, maybe if I try my black-bellied bustard call, it replies. <laughs> I'm not sure. How's that, everyone? It sounds just like a black-bellied bustard, don't you think? I wonder if if the bird thinks so. Well, it hasn't moved off, so maybe it's just curious. But look at that beautiful eye and those beautiful markings around the head. Let's see if it calls for us. Come on. Oh, have a look. It's extending its neck. Is it just going to move? Is it going to call? It's just moving very, very slowly, but let's stay with it. Let's see, come on, go past that bush, branch, there we go. Watch. There we go. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Perhaps it was replying to me. This is obviously his territory, and I shouldn't hang around. <laughs> Maybe not, maybe not. I don't think my call was that good. Wonderful to see it and to be so close to it. Usually they do move off fairly quickly. This one seems nice and relaxed for us. What a lovely sighting. So earlier I said I was going to go past Sydney's Dam and just have a look and there was actually very little water in there. It didn't look like the rain did anything for the dam and there were no animals around either. So we just continued on. It's such a fascinating call. Wonderful little display with its neck. And that is purely a territorial call. And perhaps trying to attract the female. Uh, beautiful bird. And speaking of beautiful birds, one has just landed off to our left. Um, I don't know, Jandre, if you'd like to try and see it while the black-bellied bustard moves off. It's a beautiful view of the lilac-breasted roller. It's just off to our left, sitting on a branch just below here at the bottom. There we go. Let's see if it stays there for us. Stay, stay. There we go. Now, I know a lot of our viewers do enjoy the lilac-breasted roller, and that's a beautiful view of one. And as I say that, it turns its back. <laughs> you can still hear the little busted next <laughs> next to the vehicle. And please remember everyone, it's busted, B-U-S-T-A-R-D, the busted. 
promise I'm not swearing on uh, on live of a live internet show. It's a lovely view. You can count the colours on the lilac breasted. Oh, there. oh, hang on. Oh. Well, it flew just wonder what it went to do it's just actually on this very large tree to our left the terminalia it's on the on the other side of the of the stem I wonder what it's doing there I wonder what it was doing there I wonder if that hasn't perhaps got a a little nest in there somewhere can't see it anymore it's just disappeared behind the tree now we're going to continue and see what else we can find while I do that James is snacking this afternoon now we're often asked of course how could you survive out here if you were left alone perhaps you were in some sort of a I don't know a Star Trek accident where you were beamed into this area by mistake without any form of help whatsoever could you survive and my answer is always at certain times of the year yes at other times of the year if you couldn't hunt absolutely not now over here, this is one of the times of the year, of course, where there is some stuff around. I've just shown you the edible mbezana, or pardipus, which of course means the horse's urine tree. This is the snow white berry bush, Flugia verosa, or umshangazi, in Shangan. Now, I've eaten one already, which means I'm going to give this one to Brian. Brian, there you are. Thank you, sir. Very delicious. Mmm. Mm. Wonderful. Mm. What does it taste like, Brian? Mm. Like a very sweet. Brian's face is not very impressed, mm. I must not tell you. Not delicious, this one. No, mm. no that's pretty good. <laughs> it tastes like a very sweet kind of a pea. Mm -hmm. So a pea you'd pull out of a pod, and a very sweet one. Let's try Brian with one more. Um, because this one's probably a little bit riper. There you are. Flugia verosa, if you'd like to speak Latin. Do you like to speak Latin, Brian? Oh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I did find a millipede in the middle of this bush somewhere. Isn't that nice? But the millipede seems to have absconded, right, as much as Kirill did a little bit earlier for us. Shall we continue, Brian? Oh, one more thing around here. I just want to show you is this beautiful inflorescence here. Now this is the inflorescence of Panicum maximum or buffalo, not bu guinea grass. Oh, there was a rather nasty pip there. Um, guinea grass is an excellent grazing grass but only grows in the shade and so you'll find, remember how often we've seen buffalo going snuffling around at the bottom of bushes like this and they kind of stick their noses underneath and they take this grass over here, that sort of thing there, that's what they're going for, it's this guinea grass which has got a gorgeous purple coloured seed, I don't know why it's called guinea grass and it's actually very sweet to eat in the summer. And summer, of course, it is. And Brian, how do we know it's summer? Because the woodland kingfisher is chirping away. Well, how does it chirp, Brian? <laughs> Very good. Hang on a second. Aubrey's found something else. Ah. <laughs> Score. Oh, Aubrey is now collecting. Oh, look, 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 look. He's doing this very carefully. Look at the spider. You see it, Brian? Now, I am very nervous of doing this sort of thing because I'm inexperienced. Now, look how gently Aubrey's doing it. And he's just coaxing it out. He's not pulling it out. He's just coaxing it gently out. This is a baboon spider. And just encouraging it to come out on its own. And of course the danger is if you actually pull them out, you can harm them. But just by coaxing it gently like this, you can see that amazing colour as the sun shines on it. This is a big baboon spider. And of course, to many of you, this is of course the tarantula. That is so fantastic. Isn't that wonderful? 
Now this tarantula of course has built its nest in a completely ridiculously stupid spot because it's in the middle of a road and once they if, if the hole is damaged ever, what happens is that they're sometimes very, oh, they're almost completely unable to dig another hole because once they've dug the hole, the piece of equipment that they have, I forget on exactly which leg it is, it's like a little claw that helps them to dig, uh, but by the time they've dug their burrow, that thing has gone away. It's worn down completely, and so they can't dig another burrow. And so we're very careful not to harm the hole in any way. But of course if a car drives over this, well it's going to be quite difficult. I don't believe a car hasn't driven over this, so perhaps she's still got her sort of digging implements and she's able to dig her hole. Isn't that wonderful? And Rachel, you think this is a very pretty spider. I have to agree with you. I think that they are gorgeous. And you know what? You can make them sit on your hand. If they're, I think it's probably a bit warm for them to be sitting on the hand now because they're a little bit too active. But you can make them sit on their, your hand and they've got the most gorgeous colours. There we go, holding on there. Oh, so wonderful. Anyway, let's leave that one. Isn't that cool? <laughs> that is wonderful stuff. I have never ever managed to get one out of the hole in that fashion and that of course is the joy of experience. A very gentle touching with exactly the right kind of stick got the baboon spider or tarantula out of its hole. Isn't that wonderful? Alright, Brent is still with the great queen. She's